We are in Amos, chapter 6 this evening. Father, we come before you. Lord, we pray over the different cities in the United States that are still struggling with bringing order and peace. Lord, we thank you for this country that the idea of being able to peaceably protest is at the heart of it. But Lord, the founders believed in life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, not to mention property. And how we pray that, Lord, you would just shut down this violence and things to life, these oppressions against liberty, and Lord, even the destruction of people's hard-earned property, dreams, and ambitions as towns are getting turned upside down. We pray, Lord, you would bring peace back to our cities, Lord, back to dialogue. And uh, Father, we do lift up as we go through Amos again this evening, and he cries out against how that justice for those who are impoverished often doesn't happen. Lord, it is a theme in our country. We pray, Father, you would put people in authority who are good, honorable men and women who have a heart to do what's right, Lord, according to not only your word, but also the laws of our land. And so, Lord, we bring these things before you. We pray for peace upon these cities, and we ask that these riots and, Lord, the things that are happening would suddenly cease and the peace of God would fill this country. Lord, please bring a revival. Help people to see the only real solution is to receive your Son in our hearts by faith, and suddenly we find the peace of God and the wisdom of God as we come to the Son of God. So bless this time. Lord, open your word, and thank you for this evening in Jesus' name. Amen. Amos was talking to us in chapter 5. He's speaking to the northern kingdom. And he let us know in chapter 5, and perhaps you've seen maybe even in what's going on in the news of late, this in practical experience. But he said in chapter 5, verse 10, They hate him that speaketh in the gate that is at the entrance of the city or even really within what would be the courts or the place where business is transacted. They hate him that speaketh in the gate, and they abhor him that speaketh uprightly. And even in the last week, people who were questioning some of these demonstrations and things that were turning violent and tried to withstand people that were destroying property, and we've seen some of the things have happened. And so what Amos told us in his own day as a prophet of God who was pointing out to the nation of Israel their wickedness and turning away from God, turning to false idols, and turning away from the truth of God's word, he was not well received, and he received his own series of threats, as we'll see this evening in our chapters, and obviously not a warm welcome from those that he was preaching God's truth to. So he reminds us that they hate him that rebuketh and negate. They abhor him that speaketh uprightly. So verse 11, chapter 5, For as much, therefore, as your treading is upon the poor, and you take from him the burdens of wheat, what little the poor are able to produce in their crops and in their fields and their vineyards and obviously their olive groves. What little they can produce is being taken from them by the wealthy in a number of forms, whether supporting the king or for them paying off debt and things that they've borrowed. And so they take from him the burdens of wheat. And those who take it and enrich themselves, we learned in verse 11, you have built houses of hewn stone, which is for the more wealthy and God again warned them, but you shall not dwell in them. You've planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink wine of them, because they will be carried away within 30 short years by the Assyrians. For I know your manifold transgressions and your mighty sins, and that they afflict the just. They take a bribe, and they turn aside the poor or the underprivileged in the gate from their right. And in the gate is where, again, you would find justice for your cause, and so, as we can see, the, the debate in our country arguing about how some say there's a two-tiered system. For one group of people, you get one type of justice. For another group of people, you get a different type of justice. And it is very frustrating to those who feel that they're getting the wrong side of, in a sense, justice or being discriminated against. They're not alone. Even in the days of Amos here, the poor, when they were in the gate of the city, because they were impoverished and in theory could do nothing for the people of that city, they received basically sort of the, the pushing off or saying, hey, we don't really care to hear your case, or worse yet, when they presented their problem, they would receive no redress for their issues, no justice, and many times they would suffer while the wicked, and often the wealthy who were wicked, got away with abusing 
these individuals. So not only in these days do we have people upset about injustices in the land, but at the time of Amos, the kingdom that was corrupting, that was imploding in northern Israel, one of the signs was, number one, turning away from the fear of God, turning to other things rather than worshiping God, worshiping the creation, worshiping idols, worshiping pleasures and things that went with it. And then a byproduct of turning away from a fear of God is no longer dealing with people in a godly fashion and giving, for example, the poor justice in the gate. And these were signs of a country that was headed towards God's corrective judgment. And so something we ought to pay attention to. And so he argued in verse 13, as you watch these things implode, he said, therefore the prudent shall keep silence in, the, in that time, for it is an evil time. And he exhorted the people of northern Israel, you ought to seek good and not evil. And we need that today in our streets. That you may live. And so the Lord God of hosts shall be with you as you have spoken. Hate the evil. Love the good. We have it the other way around, sadly, often in many things today. And establish judgment in the gate, regardless of whether you're wealthy or poor, the justice and the case ought to be handled the same. And that was the idea of the law, and it was mentioned throughout the law, that you should be no respecter of persons. You should hear a case on the merits of the case and render a verdict. And even in the New Testament, Paul dealing with the Corinthians, he said, you're going to the courts one against the other. And the way the courts worked in those days is it would be public, especially in Corinth. You would come to this Bema seat in the middle of the town of Corinth. You can still see it today in the ruins. And they would have these public cases. So here are believers going against believers outdoor in public in front of the courts and making a circus essentially out of their issues. And the unbelievers say, well, if that's how the believers behave, why would I want to join them is the idea. And Paul rebuking the church said, pick the least among you. Any average person who has a fear of God can hear a case and render a just verdict if they will just be a person who truly seeks after the Lord. Take anyone within the fellowship. Bring your case before them. Can they not judge these things for you? Is where he goes in 1 Corinthians 6. Interestingly enough, you can hear from people in our country that even of all people, Elon Musk, who is talking about different cases they've had to bring before the courts and how much he has been amazed with how well the jury system has worked of a jury of their peers, where they would present technical things and other issues he was going through. And interesting to hear someone even like him saying, you know, when you get among regular people and present a problem and present the statutes and present what happened, often regular people do a very good job of rendering a just decision. And so here, this idea of turn, hate the evil, love the good, establish judgment in the gate that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious unto the remnant of Joseph. So chapter 5, verse 16. Therefore, the Lord, the God of hosts, the Lord saith thus, wailing shall be in the streets again when judgment comes against the northern kingdom. They shall say in the highways, alas, alas, and they shall call the husbandmen to mourning, and such as are skillful of lamentation to wailing. And again, they'll run out of people to mourn, so they'll go to the farmers and ask them to help. And all vineyards shall be wailing, for I will pass through thee, saith the Lord. Again, bringing his judgment. So he then admonished them. Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light. As if a man did flee from a lion... And a bear met him. So just when you got safe from one danger, you encounter another. Or went into a house and leaned upon his hand upon the wall, and a serpent bit him. Shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light, even very dark and no brightness in it? And then God responding again to him says, I hate. That's shocking. I despise your feast days. I will not smell your solemn assemblies. Though you offer me burnt offerings and meat offerings, I will not accept them. Neither will I regard the peace offerings of your fat beasts. So here they have religious show again, but no practical seeking of walking with God, no practical fear of God. They want God on their terms. And so the Lord again rebuking them. Take thou away from me the noise of thy songs. I will not hear the melody of thy vows. Let the judgment run down as waters and righteousness as the mighty stream. Have you offered unto me sacrifices and offerings in the wilderness 40 years as they came out of Egypt and wandered for 40 years? O house of Israel, 
but you have borne the tabernacle of Molech and Chimam, Chiam, these false gods of the nations around them, your images, the idols, and the star of your god, which you made to yourselves. So therefore will I cause you to go into captivity, which they will in about 30 years. Beyond Damascus, saith the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts. And so that's as far as we got. Now chapter 6, we pick up again. And Amos continues here in the northern kingdom and says to them, Woe to them that are at ease in Zion. Extra time on your hands. <laughs> you can use it well, or you can use it quite poorly. And what has this country had since March? extra time on its hands. And so some people have decided to binge watch everything they can get on Netflix or Amazon Prime or Disney Plus or whatever else you may be watching, or Roku or whatever, or TV Land or wherever you go. And they've watched every series they can think of to where they can't take it anymore. Other people sadly get sucked into things they ought not. And so porn use is on the increase and other problems that go with it. If you've been in some of the stores, it seems from my perspective, a lot of people buying a whole lot of alcohol right now while they've got extra time on their hands as I go through shopping you know, in supermarkets. But some people have actually taken the time to dig into the word and to get into Bible studies and to take that time and make it useful, read different books and basically sharpen themselves in their walk with God. And it's interesting because as you go through the scripture, you'll find that oftentimes when you find people at ease is often when they find trouble. For example, King David, he goes up on the roof one evening. All the kings usually go out to battle. He sent Joab out with the army. He should have been with them, but instead he goes up on the roof there in 2 Samuel 11. And as he's enjoying a cool evening and looking around, here is a woman bathing, Bathsheba, who is very beautiful to look upon. And of course, you know what happens. He invited her ultimately to the palace, ended up getting into an affair, and eventually would kill her husband Uriah and bring great trouble upon his reign from those things. Where did it come from? A time of ease. Interesting also, turn to Ezekiel chapter 49. Left turn, Ezekiel 49. Coming after this prophecy of Amos, almost 200 plus years, Ezekiel begins to detail what happened to the northern and the southern kingdom and what did them harm. There's no Ezekiel 49, sorry, brain freeze. Ezekiel 16, 49. Ezekiel 16. You were like, wow, he's really out there. Ezekiel 16, 49. Here was the charge that came against not only the people of Israel, but in many ways what brought down Sodom and Gomorrah. The Lord speaking of Israel, often referring to him in some ways as bad as Sodom. He said, behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom, chapter 16, verse 49. One, pride. What caused creation to fall? Adam and Eve disobeying God. How did he appeal to Eve? If you eat of the fruit, it will make you wise, you'll be like God. It appealed to the lust of her flesh. It was pleasant for food. The pride of life, she would be like God. Lust of the eyes, it was pleasant to look upon, right? These different aspects of temptation. What caused Lucifer, who was a holy anointed cherub, to fall and to become a cast down from his position angel, who became a fallen angel, who led with him part of the host of heaven? What started it? His statements in Isaiah 14, I will be like the most high. I will put my throne above the stars of God. It was pride. What if anybody here married, or I guess most people at home, pretty thin tonight for us here, but for those at home, what often is the basis of most of the arguments you have in your marriage? Pride. What often causes most of the contention between you and someone else? Pride. And so one of the first problems of the Sodom and Gomorrah camp, as well as the children of Israel's one pride. The second aspect of what brought them down, fullness of bread, more than you could want. And the third aspect of what brought them down, the abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. And then the fourth condition that brought them down, neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. So here they have more than they could want. They've got all kinds of time, but they have no place in their heart to help those who are in need. And so these things came down upon Sodom and Gomorrah, which brought God's judgment. And he said, and they were haughty 
They committed abomination, and so therefore I took them away as I saw good. So, Jose, so Amos also, much like this same case, warning them in chapter 6, said, Woe to those who are at ease in Zion. That's often where trouble starts. One time I was reading a commentary. I believe it was about 1 Samuel or 2 Samuel 11 there with Bathsheba. And the commentary warned, especially pastors and those who were studying, anytime you get out of your routine is usually when you invite trouble. Anytime you have that extra time on your hands where, you know, I wonder, and you start Googling people you haven't seen in decades or whatever it may be, anytime you begin to, to wander off from the things you ought to get done is usually when you go looking for trouble and trouble finds you. There's a beautiful thing about being dipl you know, regimented in your walk with God, having a time to get into the word, having a time to spend before him. And if you have extra time, making sure you use that time wisely, not squandering it on things of ease that lead you from him. So woe to them that are at ease in Zion and trust in the mountain of Samaria, which are, again, their defenses, their strongholds, their, their fortresses, which are named chief of the nations to whom the house of Israel came. Pass sea unto Kalna. So if you aren't sure that God might bring judgment, go look at Kalna. Kalna and Hamath will both be captured by the Assyrians, most agreed by Shalmaneser III. They're taking this down. Go and take a look at what's happening with Kalna, and go thence ye to Hamath and see the great there. And then go down to Gath of the Philistines, which most argue Haziel took down, if you remember that name from before in the book. Go look at Gath of the Philistines. Look what's happened to them. Be they better? Than these kingdoms, were they somehow in a better place or more obedient? The answer is no. Be they better than these kingdoms or their border greater than your border? So see how these mighty cities and towns have been humbled by God's judgment is the idea. Ye that put far away the evil day and cause the seed of violence to come near. During this time, we have Jeroboam the second. And if you were with us in the beginning of the book, I was going through the different kings after Jeroboam II. And you'll see during the next six kings that will come up, some of them have one month that they reign, three months that they reign. We have at least three military coups that occur during these next six kings through murder and violence. And so they come to a place where their kingdom just begins to fall apart because there is no fear of God. There is evil taking over. And so this idea of not only are they going to receive judgment, but as they've put away this, the evil day, what's actually happened is they continue to just have upheaval and violence and the government keeps turning over. And so the idea is they're already corrupting within themselves and God is going to be bringing that judgment. So he warns them in verse 4, Ye that lie upon beds of ivory... What does a bed of ivory mean? How about expensive? Ye that lie upon beds of ivory and stretch themselves, which implies drunkenness and other activities go with drunkenness and couches and all that, stretch themselves upon their couches and eat the lambs out of the flock and the calves out of the midst of the stall. Again, plenty of time, plenty of food, and plenty of wickedness is the idea. Ye that chant to the sound of the viol, or the stringed instruments, the musical instruments, and invent to themselves instruments of music. What do you know? Chapter 6, verse 5. Back in Amos's day, they had karaoke. They chant to music. They had their own set of songs. And they invented to themselves instruments of music like David. David wanted to get instruments of music so he could express what was in his heart in praise to God. And if you remember when Saul early on brought him into his kingdom, David skillfully able to play with the, with the harp and the different instruments that he had. And Saul, when he had in rebellion turned away from obeying God, was suffering the affliction of that, that demonic spirit and the things that were coming after him. And when he was overwhelmed and anxious and oppressed, they would call for David. David would begin to play. And David's heart for the Lord and David's worship for the Lord so, so filled, in a sense, with the Spirit, even as he says about the Spirit being upon him, that Saul would find rest and would find peace. And so David's music, the goal of the music, was to bring praise and glory to the one who had created us. David knew had created him, where he says he was fearfully and wonderfully made. And what was man that you would think of him? David, just in love with God, sitting there, wanting to find ways so that he could express his love and his praise for God. 
They've in the same manner looked after and pursued instruments, but not that they might express their praise for God, but that they might take it and use it for their own pleasure. It is argued as we go through Ezekiel chapter 28, speaking of Lucifer, again, that cherub who fell, it talks about he was perfect in the day he was created. It talks about him having pipes and timbrels. And so many feel the idea of Lucifer's job, so to speak, before he fell, was leading in or ushering in the worship of the host of heaven to, to God upon his throne. And that where the pride and the arrogance came in as he desired to have that worship stop at him rather than go to the Lord to whom it, was, it should be given. And interestingly enough, if you look at the world around us, how often Satan will use the medium of music as well as entertainment, but in particular music to in many ways preach his own message of decadence, preach his own message of self-destruction, moral compromise. Jimi Hendrix, when he used to hold concerts, called it electric church. He was preaching a whole different message. And so if you go and look, you'll see that the music media has been used by the kingdom of darkness to spread darkness and to influence people in the ungodly behavior. But interestingly enough, as we look at David, it started with a heart that wanted to worship God, wanted to express the love for God, and wanted to find ways to, to basically bring glory and praise to God. And so here in Amos's day, they've taken musical instruments, they've invented it to themselves like David, but it's not for worship of God. It's for the decadence for basically their house party, so to speak, and the things that they do. Notice what he says in verse 6. They drink wine in bowls. Now, if I give you a thimble full of wine, that's going to take some effort to get plastered. But if you hand somebody bowls of wine, it's not going to take as long to get plastered. Take it from a guy who used to drink yards of ale. Right? We go down to, I think it was Dickinson's down on South Street. We get yards of ale. They hand you this thing that's a yard long with a big ball at the end of it, and it was full of ale. I mean, you can't do a whole lot of yards before you're toast, right? And the thing is, once you get this big glass, what do you think you have to do? Finish it. And of course, if you're there with yards of ale and a bunch of your buddies, what's the idea? Well, who can drink the most, and where does it land you? Well, if you play your cards right, possibly in jail or other problems. And so they give it to them in bowls. I know what that means. I came from that world. They like to tie on a good buzz. They drink wine in bowls. They just go for it. They anoint themselves with chief ointment. So good food, nice couches, pleasant environment, music for themselves, lots of alcohol, great perfume, wearing all the aftershave. They are having themselves quite the time. And they're not grieved for the affliction of Joseph. Here's the picture. The rulers of the northern kingdom of Samaria under Jeroboam II and his princes are living quite lavishly. They're doing just fine. And as they're living lavishly and consuming alcohol and food in these you know, sort of extravagant environments, meanwhile, outside, the people are losing their crops because of taxation. There are those, if you remember, who are panting after the dust on the forehead of the poor, how they might extract out of the extreme poor even some sort of substance that they can use for themselves at the expense of the poor. Talked about that back in chapter 2. And so basically you have a ruling elite in the northern kingdom who are completely out of touch with what the regular people are going through. And they're not, not only are they out of touch, but they're not leading the people toward God. They're leading the people into a lifestyle of decadence. I know that sounds hard to believe that there might be an elite, for example, that would greatly influence culture through music and entertainment and other things and, and really be completely out of touch with the rest of the world and be trying to convince the rest of the world that their lifestyle has meaning when in fact they're all miserable. And I, I know it sounds crazy, but it was happening in Amos's day. They're not grieved for the affliction of Joseph. They're so far from what average people will go through. Therefore, now shall they go captive with the first that go captive. These rulers who have been self-serving are going to be among the first ones taken out by the Assyrians. Those who survive the attack will be taken away as captives. And again, many of them killed. And the banquet of them that snatched or stretched themselves shall be removed. In other words, the party's over. The Lord God hath sworn by himself, saith the Lord, the God of hosts, I abhor the excellency of Jacob. I abhor, I hate his palaces. Again, their wealth and the things that they're doing. 
Therefore, because of their corruption, will I deliver up the city with all that is therein. And it shall come to pass, if there remain ten men in one house, that they shall die. And that a man's uncle shall take him up, and he that burneth him to bring out the bones out of the house. All right, hold on. Chapter 6, verse 10. Normally, when you would die in Israel, the process would be they would take the body that day. They would, they would according to Edersheim and other historians, they would wash the body, trim the nails, kind of get the body prepared, put it into what looks like a large basket to us, a buyer. And then they would take it and they would carry the body out and they would bury, as their custom, the same day the deceased, they would take them out and bury them. Sometimes in the earth, most times if they had it in caves or in dens, which are quite a few of, and they would put them there. The bones, eventually the bodies would decay and the bodies essentially would decompose. And then when the bones were left, if you've been with us in Israel, you'll know they will gather up the bones and they will put them into a rectangular box called an ossuary. And that box is able to fix the femur, which is the longest bone on your body. And so the femur and, the, and all the other bones go in there in the skull and they put a little lid on it and they will stack up these ossuaries within the family grave. And so the graves will be reused. And so that's the idea of being buried with your fathers because they lay you out on kind of a stone in some area in a cave and then you decay and you eventually get down to bones. They come in, eventually gather those all up, set it aside, put it in an ossuary. And then when another family member dies, the process repeats. That's why the gospel writers made it clear to you that Jesus was laid in a new tomb where never a man had yet been placed or laid for a burial because it's essential, you know, there was no other body in that tomb but Jesus of Nazareth. So there's no confusion about who rose from the dead. But in this case, what we learn in chapter 6, verse 10 is they'll burn these things and then bring the bones out of the house. And that's not the normal procedure. And it talks about 10 men dying in a house. So some feel what's happened here in this judgment is a plague has broken out. I know that sounds crazy. A plague has broken out. And in breaking out, as people die in these houses, rather than go in and risk the plague, some feel what's going on here is they've actually burned the houses to the ground and basically trying to cleanse and purify it away and then gathered the bones from there. We'll know for sure when we get to heaven, but this is interesting. In this time of judgment, it'll come to pass there will remain 10 men in one house. They shall die. And the next of kin, a man's uncle's uncle, shall take him up. And he that burneth him to bring out the bones of him of the house. That's not how they would normally do it. And they shall say unto him that is by the sides of the house, is there yet any with thee? Is there anybody we missed? And he shall say no or none. Then shall he say Hold thy tongue, for we may not make mention of the name of the Lord. Don't say a word. Don't mention the Lord. Again, interesting and a bit different. Is it because of the oppression of their enemies? They're afraid to mention his name. They're afraid of that having repercussions. Or is it they're afraid to mention the name of the Lord because those who have survived, having heard Amos and others, they know this is the righteous judgment of God. To lose 10 of your family members, and we have 11 kids, a family of, you know, 13, when you add us all together, to imagine losing 10 of our family members in a moment would be a devastating loss. And in that devastating loss, as they were being judged by the Lord, interesting that they will, don't, don't even mention the name of the Lord, don't even open your tongue. Well, Pastor Chris, Pastor Chris, what exactly is this all about? Well, I'll give you what I think is an approximation. Turn to Leviticus 10, left turn. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Leviticus 10. And yes, I'm sure it's chapter 10. This one I have right. In Leviticus chapter 10, what's going on if you've been through these first five books of Moses is they have Moses was given directly from the Lord the pattern for the tabernacle, the lampstand, the showbread, the altar of incense, the Ark of the Covenant, the outer court, the brazen altar, the laver, all these things he was showed. They were given instructions how to make them. And so through the book of Exodus, they then got these different um, Benzalel and Aholiab and others who made these special garments and special utensils and, and vessels and furniture. And they've gotten the whole thing completed and they've set it up. 
And so Moses has set it up, put the sacrifice in order, and he and Aaron have gone into the tabernacle before the presence of God there in the holy place. And then they came out. And when they came out, as we learn here in chapter 9, there came a fire in verse 24 from before the Lord, and it consumed upon the altar the burnt offering and the fat. And God lit the fire in front of all the people. And when the people saw the fire just spontaneously break out from God and light the sacrifice, they all fell down in worship and said, the Lord, he's God. They fell on their faces. Clearly, something supernatural has happened as they have instituted now this public worship of God through the tabernacle. And the people in seeing this are overwhelmed, like, oh my goodness, just, you know, they, they were overwhelmed by it. But then in chapter 10, while this whole event is happening and this sacrifice has been lit by God himself, Nadab and Abihu, who are they? Keep reading. The sons of Aaron. They took either of them his censer, the little sort of you know, brass type container with vents on it, and put fire therein, and put incense thereupon, and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. Most feel what's happened is rather than take from the altar that God has lit, they went to a fire that man has lit through the work of man took fire from there, put it upon the incense censer, went out, and as the whole nation is having this amazing moment with God where he lit the fire and their, their focus was upon the Lord, out come Nadab and Abihu, and they want to add to the experience. And as they come out with their strange fire and begin to do whatever they're doing and they're, the smoke of the incense, it's almost as though as God is doing something to glorify himself, they want to make sure people remember them being a part of it. And as they come out with these altar, these incense censers, with this strange fire, chapter 10, verse 2 tells us, there went out a fire from the Lord again and devoured Nadab and Abihu. And they died before the Lord. And Moses said unto Aaron, this is the thing that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me. So here God was doing a work. They want to somehow have a part in it. God will not share his glory with any other. And they were instantly judged. And before all the people, I will be glorified. And note this, Aaron held his peace. No complaint, not a word. And Moses called Mishael and Elsaphan, the sons of Uziel, the, the uncle of Aaron, again an uncle, said unto them, come near, carry your brethren from before the sanctuary out of the camp. Anybody want to go near and pick them up? That had to be a bit intimidating. So they went near and they carried them. If it's in Nadab and Abihu's coats, it's interesting. If they carried them in their coats, even though they were burned, their garments survived. That would be interesting. So whether it's their coats or the coats of the family members, we'll wait and find out. But they carried them in their coats out of the camp, as Moses had said. Here we go, verse 6. And Moses said unto Aaron and unto Eliezer and unto Ithamar, his two remaining sons, uncover not your heads, a sign of grief. Neither rip or rend your clothes, a sign of outrage or grief, lest you die. Unless wrath come upon all the people. But let your brethren, the whole house of Israel, bewail the burning which the Lord hath kindled. You shall not go out from the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, lest you die. For the anointing oil of the Lord is upon you. And they did according to the word of Moses. And the Lord spake unto Aaron, saying, here's a hint as to what went wrong. Do not drink wine, nor strong drink, you nor thy sons with thee, when thou go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die. So apparently Nadab and Abihu, well lit for some alcohol perhaps, decide they want to add to the event, and they're judged instantly. The charge to Moses and the charge to Aaron of no mourning, no signs of grief, no whatever, the reason they're admonished is because to rip your garments, to pull off your hat, to begin to grieve and mourn, would indicate that what God did was unjust. It may sound hard to understand, but the idea of them suddenly just, you know, what's going on? How could God do what? The idea is that what God did was wrong. God defending his holiness is somehow out of order. And that the problems with God, instead of Nadab and Abihu, who didn't follow very carefully what God had told them they ought to do to come into his presence. And so that idea of their suddenly complaining, mourning, or whatever, 
be a sense a judgment against God's judgment as though it was wrong. It seems that's the idea that's going on here. A house will suddenly have 10 men. None of them remain. A family member will come, have to deal with this in an unusual form. Again, this judgment of God. And then when they're saying, you know, are there any more with you? No, that hold your tongue. Don't say a word because the nation has been warned for hundreds of years to come back to God, to get right with him. Prophet after prophet coming to them, telling him their sin, telling him God will forgive them. And some of them they killed, some of them they chased away, which they'll try here with Amos. And so when God's judgment finally comes, it's right. Just as as we go through the book of Revelation, there are things we're still going to see as we move forward from chapter 11. We're going to find again God's judgment coming and the whole host of heaven saying as these judgments are poured out, you are righteous. And they begin from heaven's perspective to to call forth as witness the righteousness of God to judge the nations because they have shed so much blood, because they have done such wickedness. God now allows these things to come upon them. And so this idea here with Amos, when God's judgment comes, much like in Leviticus 10, and that begins to go against the house of Israel to the north, make no mention of the name of the Lord as though he did something wrong because his judgment and his ways are right and they are just. And I know for some people, especially if you've come from a difficult past or there are people in your life you've lost, mother, grandparents, whoever it is, someone you love dearly, husband, wife, and I'll have people say to me, you know, I have a hard time trusting God because he took my mother or he took my grandmother or he took whatever. And what they're doing is they are from this place in space and time seeing what God has allowed, and from their perspective, they have judged it and said, I disagree, I think he's wrong, and they've essentially in that moment made themselves the judge over the judge of all the earth. And that's a hard place to be because when you feel somehow what God is doing is wrong, what God has allowed seems unjust, and you begin to pass judgment upon God, we do it with a very limited workspace. These, we're stuck in, in space and time and these fleshly bodies that can only gain so much knowledge and wisdom over a course of a lifetime. And you're passing judgment upon the one who has always existed, has created the heavens and the earth, knowing man would choose to rebel, made a way of redemption for him before anything ever happened. There will be a day when we stand before God and we understand what we don't get now as we see the, through the glass darkly, as Corinthians says. But one day when we stand before him and we see him and we understand his ways, you know, all those, well, I can't wait to get to God because I'm going to ask him, why did he? I personally think when we get there, it's going to be no further questions, your honor. Thank God you pardon my case. But the idea that people really struggle with things going on in the world, maybe right now you are sitting there and the, the job you had is gone. The company that you were part of is not going to survive this downturn or whatever it may be. And, and you're beginning to say, you know, Lord, I, th I thought you loved me. And you're beginning to pass judgment on God based on the circumstances you're going through. Because you can only see what's going on in front of you or the pain that's in your heart now. It's again where if you have faith, you'll know that all things will work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. But if you let your circumstances dictate to you how you feel about God, you're then going by sight rather than by faith. And you look at different people throughout scripture. Go to Hebrews 11, read that chapter. Read those who persevered with God by faith, where it talks about without faith, it's impossible to please God. You don't think Abraham's heart was broken as Sarah said, that's it. Ishmael needs to leave and he's struggling with that. It's the only son he's known. And God says, listen, she's right. And he had to send Ishmael away. There are many times among God's people who are in the hall of faith there in Hebrews 11, who also went through some very difficult circumstances that they had to look beyond the circumstance like Joseph in prison to see God's faithfulness. Again, faith is that idea of the evidence of things hoped for, or the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I may have it backwards. You'll correct me later. But it's knowing that even though I don't know what's going on or why it's happening, I know who's behind all these things. I know who's in charge. And whether he's allowing a time of correction in my life or a time of encouragement in my life, whether I'm receiving good, as Job said, or evil, if God's allowed either, I've got to trust he's allowing it for a reason and faith shines 
when things don't make sense and our hearts are in pain and yet we're saying, Lord, I know you're good. I don't know what's going on. I don't know how this is going to get solved, but I know you're good and I trust you. And that's often where our faith in many ways comes to the top. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. He that comes to God, Hebrews eleven six, 6, must believe that he is, exists. And he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. This evening, you may be going through or listening later on the radio. You may be in a season right now that seems to speak to you anything but God loves you. Anything but he desires a relationship with you. And you're really struggling to want to trust him. I can tell you from things I've experienced, and I can tell you from many who've gone through the word of God, many that we see in the word of God, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Proverbs 3, 5, lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him. He'll make your path straight. Isaiah 26, 3, for thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. Here's the key to that verse, Isaiah 26, 3. Whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. Philippians, again, be anxious for nothing, but in all things with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, even for the bad. Let your request be made known to God, and the peace of God will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. So Amos is talking about here that judgment is going to come, and people are, gonna, are, are basically going to have a hard time with it. But if you understand the heart of God, behind, look, he sent his son to take your place. He has sent his son to bear your sin. It's already been done and bear the wrath your sins to des deserve. He has died and risen again. He has paid the wages of sin for me, for you, for the whole world. That offer of redemption stands, but you have to receive it. You have to accept him into your heart. And it may be the things going on in your life is back to you may have lost that family member or that parent or whatever it is. And that's why you've always been, I don't want to open my heart to God because look what he's done to me before I met him. Look what he's done to me before I've turned to him. His ways are not our ways, but his ways are right. One day when we stand before him in his kingdom, we'll be there with the rest of the hosts of heaven saying, you are righteous, O Lord, for these things that he brings in judgment. He has waited a very long time, not only for the children of Israel, hundreds of years, but for the Ammonites before them, 400 years, 430. Throughout the scripture, you'll find God is a very patient God, but there's a day when he must judge sin, be it a nation or an individual. But this idea of not making mention and having a problem with what God is doing, Amos understood it and he challenges them. And so in my heart, I think we're getting again Leviticus 10. God's ways are right. The judgment he allows, he has a plan. And even in his judgment, if you'll turn, you'll find his mercy. If you're willing to turn. For behold, verse 11, chapter 6, Amos, the Lord commandeth, and he will smite the great house, again, the leadership of northern Israel, with breaches, and the little house, others, with clefts. Shall horses run upon the rock? How well do horses run upon a big rock? Not very well. Will one plow there upon a big rock with oxen? Not very well. The idea is these things are basically absurd. You have turned judgment into gall or poison. You have poisoned judgment, is the idea, to the rulership. And the fruit of righteousness you've turned into hemlock or wormwood. Again, a, a poison, a toxin. You've corrupted it. Ye which rejoice in a thing of naught, which say, have we not taken to us horns or strength or power by our own strength? In other words, we know what we're doing. We know how to rule. We've got this. Don't try to tell us what to do. But behold, I will raise up against you a nation, and that is the Assyrians. The Assyrians love to conquer. You can go find there. There's different steles and cuneiform cylinders and all that. There's quite a bit of history that comes from them. They love to conquer, love to dominate, had a lot of things they would do to their slaves, pretty brutal people. They, that was in their heart. And all God did is simply just remove his protection from Israel. They wanted to come do these things. So God, after bringing warnings and warnings, finally just says, okay, Israel, your protection is left. You're wide open to your enemies. And then they come. I will raise up against you a nation, O house of Israel, saith the Lord God of hosts, and they shall afflict you from the entering of Hemath, or Hemath, which is our northern boundary, even under the river of the wilderness, which is kind of in the bottom part of the area of Ephraim, 
that heads in toward the Jordan River Valley there, their territory. And so chapter 7, as we get into the last really three chapters here as we go through, you're going to find that Amos is now being given visions by the Lord. He's showing him things that are going to come, things that are about to happen with the nation. And in the beginning here, he shows them some things and Amos begins to intercede. Begins to ask God that he might turn back from that course of action. And God hears him and finally has to show Amos why these things are going to happen. But we'll take a look at it here. So chapter 7, verse 1. Thus hath the Lord God showed unto me. This is a vision. Behold, so remember it's a vision. He formed grasshoppers in the beginning of the shooting up of the latter growth. And lo, it was the latter growth after the king's mowings. So what they would do is for some of these, these grasses and crops, they would have a first harvest that went to the kings, basically or to the king. It was part of their, their taxation, so to speak. That first mowing would go to them, and then the second crop would come up, and then that would be mowed, and that would be for the people. And so how many are, by the way, watching what's happening with the locusts in Iran and through Africa? How many have seen them in Saudi Arabia? If you haven't taken a look, there are now two waves of locusts that have come through the region of the Middle East, even going as far as into Pakistan, it's that surrounding region, and they're being overwhelmed with them. And obviously, they're already in trouble with corona, and that's causing them to have to stay home. And now they've got these locusts coming through, which is going to put food scarcity in places like Kenya and elsewhere. And if you see the, the video and the photos, it's like trying to drive through a smoke screen. It's so bad with these, these locusts just covering the cars and the roads and the whole ground just moving. And, and so these things, he's telling them, behold, I saw a vision and I saw grasshoppers in the beginning up of the shooting of the second wave of the, the latter growth here. It was after the former growth, in a sense. It was, it was, sorry, it was the latter growth. It was after the king's mowings, the former growth. And so the king's been paid. The second harvest is for the people. And as we've been learning going through chapter 6 here, the people are already struggling and in destitute. The, the wealthy among the ruling class are doing quite fine. And so what Amos is seeing is a judgment coming that is going to directly impact those who are struggling the most. They don't have justice. There are inequalities against them. The wealthy are trying to figure out how to connive and scheme more funds out of them. And so he sees this plague coming, and the direct recipient will be those who are most vulnerable. It came to pass that when he had made, or when they had made an end of the eating of the grass of the land, the grasshoppers that came in, the locusts, then I said, O Lord God, forgive. The idea is forgive or pardon. Pardon, I beseech thee. By whom shall Jacob arise, for he is small? You know, the idea that the, the poor are suffering injustice, this judgment is going to hit them squarely. Lord, pardon, I pray, will only make their situation even worse. And so in verse 3, the Lord, hearing Amos's intervention, listens, and it says the Lord repented. The idea is naham in the Hebrew. It's to relent or turning away or to have relief from an earlier decision. So as he shows Amos one way of bringing judgment, Amos sees it, cries out, and says, Lord, it'll hit the vulnerable. And the Lord pulls the judgment back. And he said, it shall not be, saith the Lord. And so verse 4. Thus hath the Lord God showed me. God gave him another vision of a way God might correct them. And behold, the Lord God called to contend by fire. Again, fire and drought and these things. It devoured the great deep, which would include the aquifers and the, the wells. And so not only a time of drought, but the fires that come with those droughts, the water supply being dried up. And again, this impacting quite a few areas of society. And it devoured the great deep and did eat up a part. And then said I, O oh Lord God, cease, again, pardon or, or forbear, I beseech thee. By whom shall Jacob arise? Again, this will harm the people, for he is small. And the Lord repented again, turned away from this direction for this. This also shall not be, saith the Lord God. What is Amos doing for the nation? Starts with an inner, ends with session. What is he doing? He's interceding. Is God hearing him? Yes. What does our nation need right now as it's tearing itself apart? Intercession. But some people are too busy binge watching. Jesus told us to watch and pray. And as we see what's happening around us, we watch our country tearing itself apart. 
we ought to be taking that time to pray and asking God to heal the land, asking God to bring a revival in men's hearts, first within his church to stand up and say, you know, he's made all nations of one blood. There's one race, it's human. We're brothers and sisters. No matter what your color of your skin, your background, what country you're from, there's only one race, it's human. And we ought to be crying out for God to bring people who are in darkness to understand how much he loves them and bring them salvation. They're looking for something. But what they really need is to look for Jesus. And so here Amos seeing these different potential judgments coming against the northern kingdom. Do they deserve it? Absolutely. But to see the harm and the cost, Amos cries out saying, Lord, pardon, I pray. And so the Lord two times now turns from a course of action that would be a just correction against a wicked and ungodly people. When I pray for our country, we don't deserve God's mercy. The pornography industry, the slaughtering of millions since Roe versus Wade, the most innocent in our society. If you have gone through an abortion, whether you're the, the woman who was involved or the guy who was part of it, and you've come to Jesus Christ as your savior, you've asked his forgiveness, those sins are covered by the blood of Christ and you have a reunion waiting for you one day in heaven. But it's awfully hard to look up to heaven and ask God to forgive us as we're one of the largest purveyors of pornography around the world. Hollywood continues to put out absolutely decadent, quote unquote, entertainment. And we've destroyed an entire segment of our population for sake of convenience. It's awfully hard to look up to heaven and ask God for mercy on our country. But on the flip side, from this country for quite a long time have come a majority of the help and the funding for missions and relief organizations and other things around the world that have brought relief and have brought good news and have brought the hope of the gospel to many different countries. And has often been one of the first countries to be there when another one suffers a time of need to provide relief. And so to ask the Lord that he might have mercy upon us in grace and perhaps he'll hear us because he loves to extend mercy and grace to those who seek him. So Amos keeps, for lack of a better way, praying away God's potential judgment. And the fact is, God does have to judge sin. If you don't want to receive Christ as your Savior, there will be a day when you leave this earth and you stand before God, and now upon you he will have to judge your sin. But if you'll repent from your sin and ask Jesus to forgive you, receiving him into your heart by faith, confessing with your mouth, you believe Jesus of Nazareth is the Savior. You believe he paid for your sin. And believing from your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you'll make that confession, that turn to God, then your sins will be pardoned through the redemptive work that Jesus has done on your behalf. And you'll be in his kingdom as a son or daughter of God. But if you reject that offer of salvation, then you will stand before him to be judged for your sin and to face the wrath your sins deserve. These are the things that are coming. So Amos is crying out. He's asking God to turn away from these things. And so chapter 7, verse 7, God has to educate his prophet. And he does it this way. Thus he showed me, and behold, the Lord stood upon a wall made by a plumb line. Plumb line, simple string hanging from above. And of course, the way it hangs, it gives you a straight line when you're building. And so hung or made by a plumb line. The Lord showing him a wall that he stood upon, made by a plumb line that was straight, that was in order, that was well done, so to speak. Here is a straight, erect, proper wall. He showed me a wall made with a plumb, by a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord saith unto me, <clears throat> Amos, verse 8, what seest thou? And Amos said, a plumb line. And then said the Lord, behold, I will set a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. And what will that plumb line re reveal? Those who are straight or right with God and those who are crooked. So God is going to bring a plumb line. In other words, I will be judging people based on the things they've done. I will set a plumb line in the midst of my people. See, each thing Amos has heard of, each vision he's seen, he said, well, Lord, have, have mercy, have mercy. Okay, okay. And finally, God says, listen, Amos, come on. Let me show you 
how corrupt things are. Let me show you why these things must come. I'll set a plumb line and it'll become obvious to you why I have to correct. Interesting. And I will not pass by them anymore. In other words, no more pardon as their corruption is clearly revealed. It will leave Amos without any argument. And the high places of Isaac shall be desolate where they turned away from God to false gods with fornication worship and drunkenness and the abuses that went with it all the way to child sacrifice through Molech and Chemosh and others. The high places of Isaac shall be desolate. The sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam, the second here, with the sword. Notice, please, verse 10. Then Amaziah the priest. What do we not have this time from Amos? No intercession. Because this time when God shows them the plumb line and makes it very clear how corrupt the society has become. Amos seeing these things as God shows him his standard and how far they've fallen from it, realizes there's no argument. And so he holds his peace. In your heart of hearts, you know you've sinned. I don't have to explain it to you. You tell a lie, you've sinned. Disobedient to your parents, you've sinned. You covet other people's stuff and wish you had it. It's happening all over in cities right now in the United States. You've sinned. You act on that covetousness and you steal from someone. You've sinned. Get involved with someone's wife or husband that's not yours. You've sinned. Take the name of the Lord your God in vain. You've sinned. Just the Ten Commandments. Most of you have broken probably close to or all the ones I mentioned in some fashion. When you understand God's standard, then he must judge sin. He has to. He has attributes that don't change. He's merciful, but he's holy. He's, he shows grace, but he is the judge of all the earth. The only way for God to deal with his judgment, his justice, and his holiness, while extending to man his mercy, his grace, and his forgiveness, is he himself has come down and bore our sins and the wrath they deserve, so he can be just in dismissing our case, and yet he is the very justifier himself of those who believe. He is the bridge between heaven and earth. It is through him that sinful man can be brought into a right relationship with a holy God. It's when we come to him by faith that he has both borne our punishment and the wrath we deserve, and therefore he can extend to us his grace and his mercy. He is the one mediator between God and men. Amos has no objection at this point when he understands just how corrupt things are. So here's Amos just preaching the word, and he gets into trouble. Verse 10. Then Amaziah, who's he? He's the priest of Bethel, where one of the two false golden calves had been set up with a corrupt priesthood with its own set of different holidays that were used to mislead, deceive, and lead the children of Israel in the north away from the worship of the true and living God. That was instituted by Jeroboam the first, and it is continuing now into the reign here of Jeroboam the second after many years. So Amaziah, the priest, this corrupt priest, sent to Jeroboam, that is the second, <clears throat> the king of Israel, saying, field report, Amos hath conspired against thee in the midst of the house of Israel. And the land is not able to bear all his words. This guy's down here telling people you're corrupt and telling people we're going to be judged and we're going to be swept away. This guy is not good for your kingdom or morale. He's got to go. For thus Amos saith, Jeroboam shall die by the sword. Israel shall surely be led captive out of their own land. By the way, all these things eventually true. And Amaziah said unto Amos, O thou seer, which is what they called prophets. You can see it back in 1 Samuel 9, 9. Listen, prophet, go, verse 12, flee away into the land of Judah and there eat bread and prophesy there. Listen, pal, get out of our territory, Go back to the southern kingdom, preach all you want down there and let it earn your living. You want to make some money from this? You're in the wrong town. Go preach to them. Maybe they'll want to hear it. Also, Amaziah said unto Amos again, Thou seer flee into the land of Judah, there eat bread, prophesy there. Verse 13, but prophesy not again any more at Bethel. You're not wanted here, nor your message. For it is the king's chapel, the king's holy place, might be holy to the king, 
but is an abomination to God, and is the king's court. So then answered Amos and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, neither was I a prophet's son, but I was a herdman. When Samuel was one of the first prophets, Moses also being a prophet, but Samuel, if you read 1 Samuel, a seer, from a young age, the word of the Lord would come to him, and he was a prophet to the early nation of Israel there during, the, he was sort of the bridge between the judges to the first king, King Saul, and eventually would pass from the scene. But Samuel was a, was a prophet. He was truly just led by God, anointed by God, and from Samuel came what is called the school of the prophets or the sons of the prophets. And that was those who, sensing a prophetic gift like Samuel, God was revealing things to, began to gather, and from there he would instruct, and they, they would eventually help to guide the nation of Israel. So if you go through 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, and throughout, you'll find about the sons of the prophets, or the school of the prophets, and you'll hear about the a seer will come at different times. And these were those that God would send to forth tell or to warn his people of either impending judgments or trouble on the horizon or even his ability to deliver them. Words of encouragement to words of correction. And that gift is also mentioned in the New Testament. Prophecy is for edification, exhortation, and comfort to the body of Christ. And so here Amos says, hey, I didn't go to one of the schools of the prophets. I wasn't, you know, that's not where I started. I didn't work my way through and then have to find a territory to work over and minister to. I didn't, you know, I'm not a prophet's son. I didn't grow up sort of in the lineage of a prophet. I was working a day job. Interesting, we have now in these last days in this time that we are living where the church is corrupting itself on different messages and all that. If you have a desire from God to have the gift of prophecy, that's a hard gift to have because he may show you things you don't want to mention. And it's going to take faith to exercise that gift. But I would encourage you to beware of ministries that say they will make you a prophet if you buy their curriculum, pay their money, go to their seminars, poof, here you go. That's a calling, not a credential. And yet we're seeing that going on in the country. Just beware of that. Amos says, look, I'm no prophet. I was no prophet, neither was I a prophet's son. I was a herdsman, again, a master shepherd. I had a day job, a gatherer of sycamore fruit, and that they do some things to, to score the outer surface to help it get more mature and fruitful. So he's basically into vineyard keeping and fruit keeping figs and a master shepherd. He's basically a farmer, so to speak. I'm not a professional. I'm just an average guy with a job. And the Lord took me, verse 15, as I followed the flock. And the Lord said unto me, go and prophesy unto my people Israel. So now, therefore, hear the word of the Lord. Thou sayest, prophesy not against Israel, and drop not thy word against the house of Isaac. Again, I'm not here on my own accord. I'm here because God called me away from what I was doing. So since you don't want to hear this, Amaziah, and since you don't want to repent of these things, Amaziah, here's the word against you, verse 17. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, thy wife shall be a harlot in the city. Ouch. Thy sons and thy daughters shall fall by the sword. They're going to be killed in the invasion of the Assyrians. Thy land shall be divided by line to those rulers who take over. And thou shalt die in a polluted land. You are going to be taken away and die in a foreign land, a polluted land. Your children aren't going to make it through the siege. And your wife, who will be ignored, is going to be forced to live her life a former corrupt priest, Former corrupt priest's wife now serving as a prostitute so she doesn't die of starvation. Your house is going to be destroyed, your lineage is going to be destroyed, and your wife is going to be forced to basically fend for herself as a prostitute. This is what will happen to you with the judgment that comes. Could he repent? Would God forgive him? Yes, he would. But apparently he didn't. Your sons and your daughters shall fall by the sword during the judgment that comes against you. Your land shall be divided by line to those who come and take it. You shall die in a polluted land, and Israel shall surely go into captivity forth of his land. And in 30, basically 30 years, these things would be fulfilled. At a time of great prosperity, within a few decades they're gone. Now there's an interesting question from this. I was a herdman gather the sycamore fruit. You might say, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a contractor or 
You know, I'm in the pharmaceutical industry or you know, I'm a dental assistant or whatever it may be. I'm, I'm just in a, you know, an average job doing, I'm a programmer. I'm, I'm just in an average job, working a job, trying to get through. And you know, I, I could never do something like this. Well, wait a second. Why couldn't God call you? He called Amos, no prophet's son, not going to the school of the prophets that was set up through Samuel. Just a guy who loved God, working his job, and God began to minister to him, I have something for you to do. And you may be someone that God has been trying to talk to, maybe even with this shutdown that we've had in the country, and you're not at your job, and you've been spending time with the Lord, and he's starting to minister to you, it's time to leave your job. I want to do this with you, whether mission field or church plant or whatever it may be. You know, you may be being called by God, and you're explaining to God why you're not capable. Well, I've never gone to a Bible college, or I don't have a seminary degree, or I, you know, I haven't even got a college degree, or well, neither did anybody in the book of Acts. But they knew God called them. God likes to use what one song called the least likely. God likes to use the one the world passes over. Samuel goes to Jesse's house goes through all the sons in the building. Are these all your sons? The Lord hasn't picked any of them. Ah, oh, there's one more, but we, we didn't even invite him. Here the prophet of Israel comes in. We didn't even invite him for the event. He's that insignificant. We just leave him out there with the sheep, call him. And in comes David. And the one the entire family didn't even bother to let have the privilege of meeting the prophet, that's the one God picked to guide his people Israel. Maybe you have throughout your life been overlooked by everybody around you, and yet you sense in your heart God has something he wants you to do. My question to you is not, why should God use you? My question to you is, why can't God use you? If you make your life available to him, you might be surprised where he'll take you, and you'll find in letting him take you where he wants you to go, you will find great joy in the midst of that calling. There would be no book of Amos. There would have been no warning to the northern kingdom if this man who had quite a good job wasn't willing to leave it and to go be a faithful witness to warn God's people that they needed to get right with him. Let's stand. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for this evening. Thank you that the lights stayed on. The equipment continued to work through uh, what was an impressive storm. Father, I lift up those at home, and maybe you have been using this time to speak to their hearts. There's more you want them to do, and it might be starting in something as simple as teaching children about your word in Sunday school. It's often when we begin simply to serve somewhere that you begin to direct our lives to the ultimate place you want us to be with the gifts and the abilities and the power of your Holy Spirit that you've given to us. So I thank you for Amos, Lord, not well received where he preached, but faithful to deliver the message nonetheless. And even while getting those stern looks and those rejected gestures in his direction as he preached, he still kept asking for your mercy upon those who were so far from you. Lord, we pray for our country. We pray for a revival among your church. And we pray for an awakening among the lost. Lord, it may well be someone this evening who's listening is one of the voices you want to use to bring this country back to your feet. Stir them, I pray, Lord, and thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen.